baseball is a game. The outcome isn't negotiated, it's decided on the field. One side wins, one side loses. Business is different. Business deals are negotiated. Today, we're going to use baseball, the business side of baseball, to demonstrate some key principles of successful negotiation. Hi, I'm Margaret Neal, Director of the Negotiation and Influence Strategies Executive Program at the Stanford University Graduate School of Business. I've spent most of my professional life studying the process of negotiation and where it goes wrong. Theoretically, no one loses in a negotiated agreement. There's simply no reason for anyone to accept a deal that makes them worse off. In practice, though, people often accept agreements that work against their own best interest. Even more often, they reach less than optimal agreements, agreements that leave one or both sides less well off than they could have been. In short, we make mistakes. We process information incorrectly or allow our judgments to be swayed by emotions or other irrelevant factors. In this program, we're going to follow the story of a lease negotiation between the owner of a baseball team and the owners of a newly renovated baseball park. In that process, we'll explore how some judgment errors affect decision making. We'll also look both at tactics you can use to prevent errors and at tactics others may use to undermine your good judgment. Ted and Billy Curry inherited a small baseball stadium from their father, Ted Sr. Ted Sr. earned his living in wholesale hardware, but hardball was the love of his life. The Sluggers were the pride of Morgan Hills, and Curry Field was a classic small-town ballpark. Then, what Ted Sr. had believed could never happen did. The owner of the Sluggers died, and his heirs sold the team. Until his dying day, Ted Sr. was still trying to get the Sluggers back to Morgan Hills. Now his sons, Ted Jr. and Billy, are trying to carry on that legacy. They've renovated the entire stadium, adding lights, luxury boxes, and additional seating, but they haven't been able to land a team. They've considered a lot of options, even deeding the park over to the city, but neither of the brothers is quite ready to give up. Plus, there's at least one last hope. They're expecting a call this morning from real estate developer Barbara Myers, owner of the Woodland Bears. The Curries are hopeful, but money is running out and they're nervous. Boy, Dad would have loved this. Wish he could have seen it. Yeah. He wouldn't have liked the lights, though. <laughs> no. No, what he would have wanted was to have every game start at 1 o'clock. Noon for double headers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but most of all, he would have wanted us to get a ball club. And if he thought lights would have done it, he'd have done exactly what we did. <laughs> I got a feeling it's going to happen, Ted. I got a funny feeling it's going to happen this time. Maybe. They say Barbara's pretty tough. You know, if it doesn't work this time, I think we're going to have to let Carla go. I'd sell my house first. I know, I know, but we got to start thinking about moving on. I know. Hey, Dad knew about money. He wouldn't want us to do anything stupid. <laughs> you remember how he used to make us go underneath the old bleachers and pick up the loose change? <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> then he'd make us put the money in our savings account. Oh, I hated that! <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, we better get upstairs. All right. Tell them today, honey. I can't. You have your degree now. You have opportunities. They don't need an NBA to answer the phone at an empty ballpark. Something may happen. I can't just quit on them now. Plus, wouldn't it be great to have a baseball team back here again? I mean, for the whole town, for everybody. <sighs> Don't you remember watching the Sluggers as a kid? Maybe this will work with Barbara Myers. Forget it, Carla. Ted and Billy have put too much money into this park. They won't get what they need from Barbara Myers. She follows the money. If they did get a deal, which I seriously doubt, 
it'd be absolute bare bones. They won't have a dime left to pay anybody. She's only calling because she knows they're desperate. Yeah, maybe. But maybe she's tired of playing in flea traps. Or maybe she's tired of coming in second. No, she won't do anything unless the money's right. I'm not expecting her to. I love you. I love you too. Morning. Good morning. No call yet. Not yet. Good. Good. We've got to think about this. Why is Barbara coming to us? She's looking for a good deal. She knows we're desperate. She thinks she can take us to the cleaners. And she can. Yeah, but she's got to know she can get other parks cheaper. How many seats are there in Woodland? Less than 6,000. Well, under 5,000, 4,839. How do you do that? I don't know. I heard they gave away a lot of tickets last year. <laughs> no kidding. Pizza parlors handed them out. Every little league and softball team got in free. Yeah, you could pick one up in any trash can in Woodland. So what Barbara was doing was trying to make her money on concessions. What if we convince her that she could actually sell tickets in Morgan Hills? Oh, we can sell tickets. We have twice the population base they do, and we have 8,000 seats. Yeah, but she's the only customer. She's got all the leverage. She's going to try and take us to the cleaners. She can't be sure she's the only customer. In fact, she isn't. There's always the city. And it may come to that. We've got to stop the bleeding. If we have to, we'll deed Curry Field to the city. So, we're going to walk away before we take a bad deal. Agreed? Agreed. And a bad deal is anything that doesn't give us break-even cash flow. Agreed? Agreed. And I happen to know that break-even cash flow is $225,657. But it'll vary with the usage, and you have to toss in a raise for me. So, you'll walk away if you don't get $240,000, right? But that isn't what you want, is it? No, what you want is the best deal you can get. So let's start looking at a target price. What do you want to get? Uh, 500,000. Earth to dead, hello? Nobody pays that much for a minor league ballpark. Nobody ever leased this kind of a ballpark in this kind of a location before. We also have to consider this from Barbara's point of view. We're guessing that her gate receipts barely met her lease last year. Look at it this way. If we charge 500000 and her gate is 500000 her net will be just as good as last year. Yeah, and she walks out of that flop house sinkhole in Woodland into a practically new ballpark with great fan base and the, and the best baseball tradition of any town on the coast. Is there any way we can find out more about her receipts from last year? Maybe. And about other offers she may have had for this year? Well, nobody's going to tell me straight out, but uh, I could do some asking around. Good. The more we know, the more options we have. Yeah, what I really want to know is how high she'll go. Maybe she'll go more than 500000 All right, Billy. <laughs> hey, 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 remember, though, the reason we're here is because we love baseball, and if Barbara isn't happy, baseball isn't going to be very much fun. Okay, <sighs> so what do I tell her? Yeah, tell her we're interested. Tell her we have a proposal we think she might like. Ted Curry and Sons. Certainly. He's right here. It's just our friendly mayor. Oh. Hey, Bob, how you doing? What we need is a list of every negotiating point. What we have that she may value, and what she has that we need. Well, okay. She has... a baseball team. <laughs> and we have the best park on the coast with 8,000 seats, which we very well may be able to sell out. Especially with a team as good as the Bears. Uh, we have the support of the community, including Mayor Bob. And we have a cushy, heated owner's box. Barbara likes to look good. That owner's box might appeal to her. Oh yeah, listen, we also have the Slugger's name and tradition. That may be touchy. Oh, we have to get the Slugger's name. It would have been important to Dad. Yeah, and it's important to me. Well, the name Sluggers may sell a lot of tickets, too. We'll just have to sell Barbara on the idea. 
Carla's begun preparing Billy and Ted to resist two common irrational tendencies in negotiation. First, people often enter negotiations with unrealistic expectations. Sometimes people are underconfident. They undervalue their assets. But the more common error is overconfidence. Overconfidence can cause you to overlook opportunities for trade-offs and for what we call integrative solutions, solutions that can create value for both parties. Negotiations and negotiation issues can be divided into two broad categories, distributive and integrative. In all negotiations, the parties must divide the resources. Distributive negotiations determine how the pie will be divided. Integrative negotiations have the potential to expand the size of the pie available for the negotiators who divide. Both parties can benefit. Overconfident negotiators often think they know in advance how a negotiation should end. They may shut out new sources of information and refuse to consider alternative solutions. Information is often the cure for unrealistic expectations, and it's critical to reaching an optimal agreement. Research ask questions, and listen. What you are looking for are opportunities to add value. First, by extending the range of issues in a negotiation to make the deal bigger and better. Second, by identifying issues which the two sides value differently. When parties value items differently, they can make concessions on issues they value less in exchange for concessions on issues they value more. That increases the size of the pie for both parties. A second common error in negotiation is irrational escalation of commitment. We're human, and we like to succeed. We like to get things done, and we like to win. Sometimes, feeling that we will have failed if we don't reach an agreement, we escalate our commitment to getting a deal until we accept one which actually makes us worse off than no deal at all. Carla has helped Ted and Billy establish two key figures that will help them resist irrational escalation in this negotiation. First, they know what their BATNA is. Your BATNA is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In the worst case, Ted and Billy can deed Curry Field to the city of Morgan Hills and stop their financial losses. That's the best alternative they have now. The Currys have also established their reservation price, their bottom line. If they don't get an offer that meets their cash flow requirement, $240,000, they'll walk away. Always know your BATNA and your reservation price before entering a negotiation, and never make a deal below your reservation price without very careful consideration. Many, many negotiators have awakened the morning after an agreement, asking themselves, what in the world got into me? Don't let that happen to you. Know your reservation price and stick to it. Hi, Barbara. Ready to call the Curry Brothers? There's no hurry. Barbara, Curry Field can make the difference for us. That field is beautiful. It's the best facility on the coast. We can win it this year in a place like that. We'll play better, we'll sign better players, we'll win. I guarantee it. It doesn't hurt to let them sweat a little. There are 10 towns on the coast begging for teams, and I'm the only one moving. They've got to understand that this deal will be on my terms. But there aren't any other fields like Curry. We'll win more. We'll draw more people. We'll sell more tickets. I can't pay the bills with promises. So let's see if we can close this deal quickly. Now, they haven't done any deals for teams in a long time, and goodness knows we've done plenty. And they're chumps. Who would own a stadium and no team? <laughs> I'll bet we can play there next year for less than the 175 we pay now. I don't know, Barbara. Curry Field isn't like the parks we've been playing in. It costs money to maintain a place like that. It's OK, Al. I know how to handle these guys. Let's see if we can get them to go with the program without teaching them their business. So, how low are you going to offer? Let's let them come up with a number. It could be a pleasant surprise. I wouldn't accept it, but it would be a good way to start. They may not know what's realistic, Barbara, 
Well, if they come in too high, they can take that field and run peewee league games on it. I don't care what my fellow owners are doing. I have no intention of running this team at a loss. Plus, we're okay at Woodland. We can always pick up our option. And have no fans, lose our best players, and maybe spend another year out of the playoffs? Don't worry so much, Al. I know how to handle this. Barbara's entering this negotiation with a lot of confidence. She's also starting out with an adversarial attitude. There's some us versus them game playing in most negotiations, but like overconfidence, overcompetitiveness can make us behave irrationally. Overcompetitive negotiators see every issue as a distributive, your loss is my gain contest. They succumb to the mythical notion of a fixed pie. In fact, most negotiations are multidimensional and offer opportunities for integrative pie enlarging solutions. If Barbara doesn't stay open to mutually beneficial proposals, the negotiation may falter or good opportunities may remain unexplored, leaving potential value undiscovered. Let's discuss a couple of the tactics Barbara's planning. First, she'd like to get to a quick deal. Sometimes when the other party is poorly informed or inexperienced, quick deals can be to your advantage. Be aware, though, that most business agreements involve long-term relationships. If Ted were to give in to Barbara's demands quickly, out of desperation, and later feel deceived, the long-term implications for the lease aren't good. Barbara also plans to let the Currys make the first offer. Some negotiation coaches recommend that you always get the other party to make the first offer. You may get the type of pleasant surprise Barbara's hoping for. The disadvantage of not making the first offer is that you may be allowing the other party to set what we call an anchor. Anchors are base figures from which negotiators add or subtract to judge offers. Research shows that people consistently look for and rely on anchors in making judgments, whether these anchors are based on anything relevant or not. Because we want signposts and guides to help us with our judgments, we focus on anchors that often have very little significance. In a negotiation, the first number presented often becomes an anchor, and the position of that anchor very often strongly affects the final outcome. When negotiating, you don't want to allow yourself to be tied down by meaningless anchors, and you want to be very careful about the anchors you set. If you do make the first offer, it should be ambitious, but it should also be discussable. Barbara has prepared herself to walk away if she gets a ridiculous first offer. Your offer needs to be reasonable enough to assure that the other party will not abruptly break off negotiations. It needs to be in the ballpark. Ted Curry and Sons. Certainly, Barbara, I'll put you through to him. Okay, just so we don't forget anything. You don't have to tell her we're desperate. <clears throat> hi, Barbara, how are you today? Yeah, I can make time here. We've been kind of busy. What's up? Well, there's a chance. We certainly can't hurt to talk. Uh, well, the stadium's in top condition. We have all new seating, new turf, and the locker rooms are completely remodeled. Uh, we've added six luxury boxes, including a cushy new owner's box. Heated, air-conditioned, telephones. It even has a TV set up. So tell me, what are you looking to improve from your current situation? Mm-hmm. Now, what kind of concessions did you do? Now, as I recall, your ticket prices were pretty low. Uh-huh. What was your uh, total attendance? Uh-huh. We can seat 8,000 here. Uh, I think that'll be a substantial upgrade over what you have over there. 
Plus, there's not a bad seat in the house. It's a pretty picture seeing 8,000 customers. Paid customers. 8,000 paid customers. Well, uh, we feel that 500,000 is a fair figure. <laughs> Yes, that's for one season. <laughs> what did you have in mind? Well, you know, maybe it won't work, but since we have other proposals to consider, I'd like to keep discussing possibilities. Why don't you come over and look at the field? How about Thursday? 10 o'clock? Great. I'm looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Other proposals? Like what, selling cookies door to door? Hey, we do have some other options. Couldn't just sit there cap in hand. So, what did you learn? Yeah, she's tough. She doesn't give out much. She wouldn't give me the attendance figure. She said the gate was okay. <sighs> Ted described Barbara as being tough, which means she wasn't giving away much information. Barbara may have sensed that telling the Currys her attendance figures would give them power, so she resisted. Similarly, the Currys wouldn't want Barbara to know their reservation price. But too much secrecy can be a problem. When negotiators act on incomplete information or incorrect guesses, they often miss opportunities to enlarge the pie for everyone. While Barbara wasn't giving up information, she wasn't getting any either. Ted was the one asking questions and keeping notes. A better approach for her would have been to initiate an exchange of information. For each question she answered, she would ask a question and allow Ted to reciprocate. Reciprocating exchanges of information build trust and understanding. They allow parties to discover items they value differently and to trade them off. They also open up opportunities to expand agreements and add features and benefits for both parties. Of course, there's no requirement that you answer every question. Now, more observations about the two sides' bargaining tactics. Barbara obviously reacted with shock to Ted's $500,000 proposal. A shocked or surprised reaction, what might be called a flinch, can prevent an anchor from taking hold. The other party may make an immediate concession or may never bring up the original figure or proposal again. Ted maintained his composure and avoided overreacting to Barbara's surprise. Barbara also chose not to make an immediate counteroffer, hoping, perhaps, that Ted would make a second offer first. Had she stated a figure, she would have set a second anchor and a range of the negotiation would have been established. No one really expected the Bears to finish so strong last year. Yeah, but we came up short. Second place is just first place for losers, and I don't like to lose. How's it look for next year? We've got a couple of kids who can throw. If they learn how to pitch, we'll be all right. I'd like to pick up an experienced outfielder who can hit for average, but we probably won't. Even without that, though, we look pretty good. We've got a shot. Well, I guess a more important question is, where you plan to do it from? Morgan Hills? Your stadium is one of several that I'm considering. Well, we'd like to have a competitive team in here, and the Bears are a contender. Uh, I'm correct in assuming you're looking for a stadium for the upcoming season. Uh-huh, if we can get it done. Of course, we can always pick up our option here in Woodland. It can be done here. The locker rooms are immaculate. In April, that turf will be so green, it'll make you want to cry. Uh, Curry Field is ready. We'd like to have a team in here next year. What about dates, scheduling conflicts? Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Baseball will always get first priority at Curry Field. I admit it looks great. It's money, though, Ted. You can't expect big money from an independent team. It's just not part of the picture anymore. People have too many other recreation options. How much have you been bringing in over here? Oh, we haven't pushed any other events yet. Our goal is to bring baseball in here. Right now, that's what we're going to concentrate on. Let me ask you this. How much were you making over at Woodland? 
And that's not exactly the kind of place you'd want to take your kids to on a dark night. <laughs> yeah, the stadium is showing its age. But I know what I can do there. I've got a strong financial arrangement. What's your current lease rate? Last year, I paid $175,000. This year, I can probably get it for less. Plus, I'm going to get a better split in the parking. And the concessions have been good, very good even. Did your uh, gate receipts match your lease? We came close. We'll do better this year. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should look at it this way. At Curry Field, your gate receipts will not only meet a $500,000 lease payment, they'll exceed it, maybe by a lot. In the meantime, you'll be playing at a great stadium in front of a lot more fans, and we'll be selling a heck of a lot of hot dogs. It sounds great, Ted, but I know what I can draw in Woodland. Nobody knows what we can draw here. Besides, what's to guarantee you'll keep this place up? <laughs> oh, come on, look around you. We're not gonna let Curry Field go downhill. Our name's over the door. What we want is a team that's gonna want to stay here for 20 years. And we're not gonna leave the sprinklers on like I hear they did a couple of times over at Woodland. I heard you had your outfielders in rubber boots. I thought they looked very cute. Come on, I wanna show you something. What about game day expenses? Who cleans the stands? Well, I'm assuming you want to take the concessions, Barbara. You don't take the concessions, we'll clean the stands. <laughs> oh, no. We need the concessions. You know that as well as I do. Well, I can contract you crews to have the stadium swept clean within six hours after you leave the field. At what price? I'll have to get back to you on that, but I think you'll like it. Five hundred thousand is ridiculous, and you know that, Ted. No, it isn't if we can sell a quarter million tickets. What makes you think you'll be able to fill this many seats? Oh, I can go to my Rotary Club meeting tomorrow and sell 100 season tickets. At the Sports League banquet next month, I can sell 200 in 20 minutes. This is a slugger's town. People want baseball back, and they're willing to pay for it. Look, I, I know we can sell 6,000 tickets a game, and note I said sell. Bringing the sluggers back is going to send a, a lightning bolt through this whole part of the state. It'll be front page news. It's the bears, Ted. I want you to consider something, Barbara. Around here, the name Sluggers is going to sell tickets. I'm betting that we could sell 2,000 season tickets in the first week. Ted, I want you to consider something. I've got T-shirts, pennants, plastic cups, caps, all with B-E-A-R-S printed all across them, not to mention uniforms and gear bags. <sighs> Ted, I'd be willing to consider something in the 200,000 range, but what you're asking is out of the question. Well, we have fixed costs in excess of that that we have to cover. To that extent, my hands are tied. I mean, maintaining a park like this isn't cheap. What is your cash flow requirement? Well, that's going to vary with the uh, usage and the type of agreement we make. Approximately. Um, What's your debt coverage? <laughs> I think that's something I'll keep between me and my banker. Barbara, what I'm looking for is a long-term agreement that works for both of us. But 500,000, Ted, this isn't the Yankees we're talking about. I understand that, Barbara. But, you know, see, I think that with this community and this stadium, you have the potential to maximize the value of your team. It's an ideal situation. How about stadium control? Well, I'd be willing to negotiate that. As I said, baseball have first priority, and I'm flexible about who has control. May I make a call? Sure, let's take a look at the owner's box. Well, it'll be all yours. Twelve months a year. Very nice. Here's your phone. Help yourself. Thank you. Hello, Al. It's Barbara. I'm running a little late. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you.
I have a lunch meeting with Al Griggs. We're a long way apart, Ted. I have real expenses to meet, real salaries to pay. I can't gamble on some imagined set of fans that may or may not show up. Well, I can understand that, Barbara. Let me go back and talk to my people again. Maybe we can come up with a package that covers all the issues we talked about today and a few others. I think we might be able to get you what you need and put your ball club in Curry Field, which I think is something we both want. Does that TV work? Split screen, satellite hookup. You can watch three games at once. One on the field, two on the two. <laughs> nice. Let me show you out. Thanks. Several interesting things happened in this first meeting. First, notice that Barbara is already escalating her commitment. She came in thinking she wouldn't pay any more in Morgan Hills than her current rate in Woodland, $175,000 but she's already talking about an offer in the $200,000 range. This isn't necessarily a mistake. Ted's already given her valid reasons to value the field highly. And it may also be the case of falling in love with Curry Field and its plush owner's box. You may also have noticed that despite Barbara's earlier first reaction to the figure, which was shock and disbelief, Ted's anchor of $500,000 is holding. Barbara perhaps made a mistake in not demanding he make a more realistic offer before they proceed. Now we have two anchors, Ted's at $500,000 and Barbara's at $200,000. If Barbara could have gotten Ted to state a price of $400,000 before she made her first offer, the range between the two anchor prices would have narrowed and the midpoint would have moved lower. It doesn't necessarily make sense. In fact, it's often downright irrational, but negotiations often end with a splitting of the difference. That's one reason to be careful about where anchors get set. Another important issue that came up in this last scene involved what we call framing. Our research shows that people can react very differently to identical proposals when the perspective or frame changes. For example, Instead of focusing on risks in a negotiation, you may want to focus on opportunities. Or rather than focus on purchase price, you might want to focus on net profit potential. Barbara is comparing ballparks and features. Using her frame, the deal makes no sense. No ballpark is worth two and a half times what she's paying now. From her perspective, if one ballpark is worth $175,000, a better one might be worth $200,000. Ted is trying to adjust Barbara's frame by getting her to look at the net figure, the difference between gate receipts and the lease price. When we use Ted's frame and compare the net of gate receipts and lease costs at the two parks, $500,000 begins to seem more reasonable. The issue of gate receipts brings up yet another important issue in which we human beings often behave unpredictably. Humans often have very different reactions to risk. Since we don't know how many spectators a team would draw in Morgan Hills, the deal is risky. In any situation, two parties may react very differently to risk. One party may be primarily concerned with security, while the other may be looking for upside potential. When parties have different risk preferences, opportunities for mutually beneficial trade-offs often arise. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Al. So, you got me my ballpark yet? Here's where we stand. I countered his 500 figure with an offer of 200. So what did he say? Not much, but he didn't look thrilled. He says he'll get back to me with a package. We can win in that park, Barbara. Curry Field's got class. Plus, it's a winner's park. What's that mean? It means that the teams that have played there have always won. What's that got to do with us? <laughs> Everything. I'd like a club soda, please. I wouldn't get my hopes up, Al. We're a long way apart. No ball club of our size pays that much just to use a stadium. His ticket sales estimates were completely unrealistic. What was he saying? 6000 paid. Morgan Hill has always been a great baseball town. You mean you think that's possible? 
Jeez, Barbara, I don't know. I wish it were possible. Did you see that field? Now that's really baseball. I'm sick of broken sprinklers and gopher holes. Half the time, we can't even get any hot water in the showers. Curry Field can make this team happen. Just stay open to the possibilities, okay? Maybe the Curry brothers can make something good happen. Did I tell you Ted wants us to change our name to the Sluggers? Really? That'd be great. Sounds silly to me. Oh, the, the Sluggers were legendary. <sighs> Plus, what's that do to our merchandise inventory? There must have been more than a dozen major leaguers who got their starts with the Sluggers. It would help us sign some good kids. The Sluggers? <laughs> Okay, these are the points we have to cover. Lease rate, length of contract, concessions, parking, plus game day expenses. Ushers, security, grandstand janitorial. Oh, and ticket prices. We don't want her to jack the ticket prices out of reach. Uh, who's that? Mayor Bob wants to have lunch. <laughs> he asked how the negotiation was going. Where does that guy get his information? Does a lot of lunches. How much lunch can one guy do? Guys, we've got to also discuss the name change. It's got to be the Sluggers. Maybe that's asking for too much. What's the point if it isn't the Sluggers? A team's a team, Billy. But, you know, we'll keep on trying. Don't, we're not going to give up on it. Look, I think what we better do is uh, run some projections based on attendance. Um, gate receipts, parking, concessions. Now, how about we give them high, medium, and low? The low attendance projection puts her gate at 425,000. Maybe we should drop to 425. 75,000 is a pretty big drop right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Drop 75K and we'll take half the parking. Okay, 425 and we take half the parking. Three years. We need a minimum of three years. Why not start with five? Maybe she's ready for something long term. Yeah, good point. Yeah, okay, five it is. What else we got? Did they move? 425, but they want to split the parking. That's better. There is no way I'm paying 425 for one season. Hold on, they've got some projections here. Oh, give me a break. Their low attendance projection is twice what we drew in Woodland. It's ridiculous. Maybe not. How much more likely would you be to go to Curry Field than Woodland Municipal Rat Hole? <laughs> Gee. If it was true, that would be nice. This kind of attendance puts some real bounce in the concession mm -hmm. figures. But I'm not making any deal based on pie-in-the-sky attendance figures. We aren't going to make a deal based on pie-in-the-sky attendance figures. 225 might be possible, but even that may be out of reach. Would 225 get this done? Well, what if we were to bring this down to 415? Do you think we could do business? I don't think so, Ted. I would consider 250 if you took care of all the maintenance and I got all the parking. At 410, I can't include grandstand maintenance. That's a variable cost. It has to be contracted separately. Uh, frankly, Barbara, I don't know where we go from here. All right. Goodbye. She's still at 250. It's like she knows she's our only hope. We could live with 250, I suppose, but it wouldn't be fun. What if I propose splitting the difference? Oh, I don't think we're ready for that. It's not like it makes much sense anyway. I say we find some other way to make this work. I agree, but we can't just sit around here all day and negotiate with ourselves. We'll talk ourselves into being parking lot attendants if we're not careful. We've got to get back on track. Both of us want the team to succeed. Let's find a way that if the Bears do well... Sluggers. Okay, if the Sluggers do well, both sides win. You, you know, I guarantee we can get the attendance she needs if we change the name to Sluggers. Guarantee? I guarantee it. And so would I. Would you be willing to guarantee it to Barbara? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's figure out exactly what we're willing to guarantee. 
We talked earlier about differing reactions to risk. Often, one party is more adverse to risk than the other. Other times, the two parties perceive risk differently. That's what's happening with Barbara and the Currys. The Currys are confident Barbara will get more than enough attendance to meet her lease payments. Barbara isn't. Advance payments, variable payment schedules, guaranteed payments, and options are all ways of trading risks among parties. They make deals more complicated, but they sometimes smooth the path to agreement. Of course, Ted, basing the lease rate on attendance makes sense, and I think it's a step in the right direction. But I'm just not going above 250000 I'd be the laughing stock of the league if I did that. <laughs> Some teams in this league pay less than half that, way less. I'm not going above two fifty, Ted, and I'm not even the least bit comfortable with that figure. Mm-hmm. I will, but I don't know what good it will do. <laughs> okay, see you then, Ted. So where are we? Well, we've gone back and forth a few times. He came down to 425, then 415, then 410, and he kept taking longer to get back to me. Then he came up with a variable lease rate based on ticket sales, which is kind of interesting. The payment could go as low as 175000 if we don't draw 3000 again. But he and I both know we're going to draw over 3 k I'm just not going to go over 250 <laughs> And we can't get anything done quickly because he always has to check with his people. Now, if his next offer comes in at 405 and he still wants to change the name to Sluggers, and he still wants 50% of the parking, 175 is exactly what we're paying here. But we can only get that at Curry if the attendance averages under 3000 If we sell more, he's going to make a killing. He can still get as much as the full 500000 Jeez, Barbara, it's not so bad. We're guaranteed that we won't pay more than Woodland if we don't get better attendance. In fact, that's sounding pretty good to me. I know, but I'm not going over 250. I don't care how much we draw. It's a great park. I will never pay over 250,000 for a ballpark lease. So, what do we do next? It's up to them. Look, Al, I'm not sure we're going to get there. I'm not running a charity for the Curry Brothers. We talked before about integrative negotiations. Integrative solutions increase the size of the pie. Price negotiations and any negotiation that is based purely on one issue are distributive. They determine how a fixed pie will be divided. Despite Ted's attempts to reduce Barbara's risk by basing her lease rate on attendance, the negotiation is stalled over the distributive issue of the lease rate. Barbara is willing to pay a maximum of $250,000. Under the variable rate proposal, Ted wants up to $500,000 if they sell out the stands. There's still a lot of pie separating them, about $250,000 worth. Here are a few things to be aware of if you find yourself locked in a distributive negotiation. First, bids are more than offers. There are also signals. Big changes in the size of your bid indicate that you'll probably be willing to make further concessions. Smaller changes indicate less willingness to change. The speed of your offer will also be read as a signal. The faster you respond, the more eager you will appear, and the more likely it will seem that you'll make further concessions. Ted has reduced the size of his concessions and is taking more time between them. Like most people, Barbara is reading this as an indication that he's unlikely to move much further. Small increments and changes are signals, but they're also prudent. Ted is making sure he doesn't jump below a figure that Barbara might accept. Now, a few suggestions if you reach what appears to be an impasse. First, it's important to keep focusing on interest rather than positions. Positions are specific figures and proposals. Interests underlie these positions and are often multidimensional. By focusing on all your interest, you're more likely to uncover new integrative proposals that can break the impasse. Second, take a break. 
Timeouts may be used to consult with your colleagues or to refocus on both your interest and your counterparts. They create opportunities to discover integrative solutions. Sometimes, especially when things are getting a little tense, a timeout is just what everyone needs. It may also be useful to bring in a third party. A fresh perspective sometimes gets a negotiation back on track. I don't know, Carla. It's almost like the variable lease rate had no effect. She's fixed on $250,000, and she's not moving. It doesn't make sense. Even in the worst case, she'd have the same lease payment here as Woodland. She gets a better ballpark, and she doesn't spend an extra dime. And the truth is, we're going to draw a whole lot better than Woodland, and she knows it. She's playing tough. She wants to take it to us. Hey, guys. Look. Just been to the local sports store in Woodland. 75% of their stuff's got a big W written all over it. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the team name is. She leaves Woodland, all this stuff's headed for goodwill anyway. Do you think she knows, or is she just playing games with us? The big concession at the end that doesn't cost her anything. I don't know, but I'm tired of it. <laughs> Look, I don't think she's gonna move anymore, Billy. We're just negotiating with ourselves now. I had lunch with our friendly mayor. Again? And he paid. <laughs> he must have had a coupon. <laughs> oh, he said he wanted to talk to Barbara, reassure about the support she'd get from the city. Well, what do you think, Carla? He wants a team as bad as we do. And it's all to his advantage if he doesn't have to spend city money to get it. He also mentioned that he had a line on a former major leaguer. Oh. That's all we need. Add contract negotiations to the mess we've already got. Yeah, but geez, why not? Mayor Bob can sell snowballs in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're not negotiating with him. He'd take us to the cleaners. We'd all be singing, Bob's in the money, while we went along for the ride. <laughs> he does have a certain style. <gasps> Shall we invite him to our meeting? I don't think it could do any harm. As long as Barbara approves, I think she might like to meet the mayor. Oh, ask her to bring Al Griggs, too. Bob said he had something he wanted to run by him. I think we should give it a shot. Absolutely. Let's do it. Hey, you can eat that sandwich. As Carla pointed out, basing the lease rate on ticket sales should have swung the deal. At the worst, Barbara was getting a better park for the same price as her old one. A park where even she admitted she was almost certain to approve her attendance and concessions. Why didn't it work? For the same reason many negotiations don't work, people often act in unreasonable, irrational, and emotional ways. Barbara has anchored on the $250,000 figure. She's afraid of being ridiculed if she exceeds it, and right now, she's not open to any proposals that go higher. It's understandable that the Currys might be angry, but anger really doesn't do them any good. Fortunately, Carla's keeping them on the right track. Maintain a cordial, rational negotiation and keep trying. Two other interesting topics came up in this last scene. First, we now know that the novelty's inventory isn't important to the name change issue. Since they have either the town name, Woodland, or a W on them, most of Barbara's hats, pennants, and the like will be worthless if the team moves to Morgan Hills whether the bear's name is changed to sluggers or not. We don't know what Barbara's motivations are, but this may be a tactic. Some negotiators will insist on a seemingly trivial issue and save it as a bargaining point. Information helps here. Now that Ted knows most of the souvenir inventory will be worthless anyway, the Currys won't let it become a factor in the name change issue. Second, Ted and Billy are concerned about a tendency to negotiate with themselves. Sometimes, when the other side isn't responding quickly to proposals, you may begin imagining and arguing their positions for them, making guesses about what they require in an agreement. To control this negotiating in a closet tendency, avoid making subsequent proposals until all points of a previous proposal have been discussed. If necessary, you can ask directly for a point-by-point -point response. The Currys have decided to invite Mayor Bob to their next meeting with Barbara, with her permission, of course. 
Mayor Bob seems to be the kind of person who can make a deal and leave everyone feeling like a winner. Let's see what he can do to get the sluggers back in Morgan Hills. Barbara, have you ever heard of a guy named J.J. Bartell? Oh, well, of course I've heard of him. Led the National League in doubles twice, lifetime average of 285. Yeah, I think we've heard of J.J. Bartell. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he spent a season and a half playing for the Sluggers right out of high school. He was hitting 411 when he signed. Last guy ever to hit 400 for the Sluggers. <laughs> I was talking to his granddad last night. His granddad? Well, actually, it's his wife's grandfather. Not many people know this, but he met her one winter when he was back here in Morgan Hills. Anyway, last week, I was having dinner with her granddad, and he said that J.J. was looking to move out of L.A. He wanted a smaller town to raise his kids in. He also said that he might be interested in getting back into baseball. To play or coach? Well, I suspect he'd want to get into coaching eventually, but, uh... I'd imagine he's got some hits left in him. How old do you think he'd be? Late 30s, maybe? Uh, 37 in July. I don't know. Player coach, maybe? That's kind of what I was thinking. Whoa, guys, hold on a second, huh? Barbara, when J.J. Bartell turns 50, he'll still be able to hit line drives at midnight, blindfolded. <laughs> that's that's kind of the impression I got from his grandpa. I mentioned it to Dan down at the paper, and he uh, put together a little uh, something that might interest you, Barbara. Oh! The Look sluggers that. come home! That's, That's great. cool! <laughs> Do you have any idea how much a guy like J.J. Bartell would have been making when he retired? I thought of that. Now, his granddad said he was just looking for an opportunity to give something back to the game. Plus, maybe uh, work his way into managing. Right now, all he's doing is getting fat and coaching Pee Wee League. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is, you'd sign him with a standard contract, providing, that is, he was playing for the Morgan Hills Sluggers. Some negotiations inch forward to an agreement. Other times, a creative solution that has been available all along, but has been invisible, suddenly reveals itself or a solution seems to arrive fortuitously. Partly it's luck, and partly it's the result of being willing to stay open to new possibilities. I think a flexible lease rate schedule might prove workable for us, Ted. Great. I think it's a good proposal for both of us. Does this mean you got J.J. Bartell? It certainly looks good right now. What I'd like to do is review that payment schedule you sent me. A mock-up of the newspaper page and J.J. Bartell have broken Barbara loose from her $250,000 anchor. Now that she believes in the Curry's attendance projections, the rebirth of the sluggers seems assured. But Barbara and Ted still have work to do. They have to resolve details about parking, stadium control, length of contract, security, and grandstand maintenance. And they'll need to go over every detail of their agreement to make sure no misunderstandings remain. Research shows that negotiators often get careless about small details when the big ones are resolved. Remember to negotiate to the end, fairly and amicably. A hundred dollars is a hundred dollars, and there's no reason to give it away. Okay, Billy, did you get those figures from the mayor on the... Some people always like to write the agreement to assure that no important details are left out. Others leave the responsibility to the more experienced party. In either case, the agreement will need to be read carefully. Great, you covered yourself for 8%. Boy, well, you've been busy. Way to go, Ted. <laughs> I've been busy. Good yes. job. And since wording of an agreement can be ambiguous, both parties will want to look each other in the eye and be sure they're agreed about the meaning of every provision before they sign. Um, a clear, okay. well-understood agreement paves the way for a profitable, parking? amicable partnership. Here in Morgan Hills, we grew up with the sluggers, and they're back. It's the beginning of a new dynasty. Wow. I love that. <laughs> Ted. 
I forgot to mention it, but I need to have the park for two weeks in the spring for a clinically run. I trust that'll be okay. Uh, split the revenues? <laughs> that really isn't what I was planning on. Well, let's talk about it tomorrow. I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of opportunities to work together. Oh, and I really don't want to mess with the grandstand cleanup. What if you take care of it and the parking fee collection, and I'll give you 60% of the parking? Let me check with Carla. Carla, yeah. how would it work for us to do the cleanup in exchange for 60% of the parking? Um, should be fine. Hmm? Yeah, great. Well, that'll work just fine. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back and join the party. All right. All right. <laughs> Did you notice Barbara's attempt to grab an extra concession during the photo session? Sometimes that's called a nibble. When the deal's done and everybody's feeling happy and cordial, one negotiator asks for an additional little concession. Not wanting to upset a happy occasion, the other may concede. Ted countered Barbara's nibble in the best possible way. He started the process of negotiating a post-settlement settlement. Often, when the agreement is secure and tension and competitiveness are gone, adjustments can be made that benefit both parties. Now that we have our agreement and Morgan Hills has a new set of sluggers, let's review. We've learned about common negotiating errors that cause us to behave irrationally. Because of overconfidence in our own positions, we fail to consider all relevant information and end up with no deal or a suboptimal one. Or because of underconfidence, we fail to value our assets adequately. Out of a desire to close the deal, we escalate our commitments to irrational levels. We become too competitive and succumb to the myth of the fixed pie. Then we take baseball-like, your loss is my gain positions and fail to explore the full potential of a negotiation. To help orient ourselves, we anchor our bids and offers around historical figures, industry standards, or even first offers, which often have little or no relevance to the current negotiation. We frame problems incorrectly, take incorrect perspectives, and fail to consider the most critical issues. We either overestimate risks or underestimate them. To improve our risk assessment, we need to list both risks and rewards and assess the probabilities. While we focused most here on how emotions can interfere with a rational negotiation, it's important to be aware that emotions can also work to everyone's advantage. Research shows that negotiators who are in a positive mood are more likely to achieve integrative agreements. Amicable, trusting relationships can lead to mutually beneficial exchanges of information and to the discovery of opportunities to add value for both parties. But it's important to remember that emotions can make you make mistakes. Sometimes you'll dislike your negotiating counterparts. Other times you'll find them so likable you'll be inclined to make offers that are too generous. Don't let your personal feelings overwhelm your professional judgment. Acknowledge your feelings. It's okay. We all have them. But stick to business. And remember, not all negotiations should end in agreement. Sometimes the best deal is no deal at all. Take your time. Ask questions and research and trade information. Then evaluate proposals thoroughly, staying open to creative solutions by focusing on your interest rather than just winning. That's how to negotiate a better deal.